Hello, everyone. Welcome to the lecture number four of the Scientists from India's Past and Present series. This is an online lecture series celebrating the achievements of scientists from India. This uh, lecture series is a part of uh, the science outreach activities, which are conducted by the Indian National Young Academy of Sciences, of which I, Anup Mahajan, am a part of. What we are trying to do over here is trying to publicize the work that has been happening in the scientific field from India. There are plenty of Indian scientists who have done amazing uh, uh, things in, in, in their own fields, but we don't hear about it very often. So that was the main reason for starting this uh, series. So far, we've had four, uh, three le lectures, and today we'll have a fourth one, which is going to be on the reflections of the multifaceted life and legacy of Professor Radham Narsimha. Uh, I'm not going to give a big introduction about uh, Professor Narsimha because uh, our moderator will be doing that for us. So I'll just give a very quick introduction to the moderator, uh, Ashwini Ratnu, and he'll take over. So Professor uh, Ashwini Ratnu is an associate professor at the Aerospace Engineering Department at the Indian Institute of Trump, uh, Indian Institute of Sciences. Sorry, uh, he works on the guidance and control of autonomous vehicles. So he's obviously aiming for the future, as you can see. He's a member of INYAS uh, and is a fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. He is, as I said, a, a member of INYAS and also a member of the Guidance, Navigation and Control Technical Committee. So with that, Ashwini, uh, I'll hand over the mic to you and you can take and, uh, take up and introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Anu, for the introduction. Uh, just a small thing. So I am an associate fellow of American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. All right. Um, a, hello and a very warm welcome uh, to all of you. I would just uh, share my screen. And Anu, can I go on? Yes, please go ahead. I've stopped sharing mine. Yeah, just let me know if my screen is on. Yes, you can see it. If you can go into full screen. Yeah, that's perfect. Is that okay? All right. Thank you, Anu. So uh, once again, hello, everyone, and welcome to this lecture celebrating the life and legacy of one of the greatest scientists of modern India, uh, Professor Rodham Narasimha. With a long and illustrious career of scientific and technological excellence spanning more than six decades, uh, Professor Narasimha leaves behind a legacy, which is a living inspiration for the younger generation. Uh, a short lecture like this can in no way do justice highlighting his uh, vast body of contributions. So this is just an humble attempt and indeed uh, very, very partial in that regard. Um, Professor Narsimha's wife, Dr. Nilima Narsimha and his daughter, Professor Maitre Narsimha have also joined us in the audience on behalf of Indian National Young Academy of Sciences. Uh, we extend a very warm welcome to them. Uh, this lecture is organized in the form of a panel comprising three young leading scientists who are um, experts in their areas of research and they have also worked with Professor Narasimha. Um, I will just present a very brief biographical sketch of Professor Narasimha and thereafter introduce the speakers. In total, the panelists will take about 45 minutes um, giving their talks and after that we'll have a brief session on questions and queries. Um, posted by the audience and audience can use the YouTube or Zoom chat box for posting their questions. So let me start with a very brief biographical sketch of Professor Rodham Narsimha. Uh, so about his early life and education. So he was born to Srimati Leela Devi and Sri R.L. Narsimhaya on July 20, 1933 in Bangalore. He did his schooling in Acharya Patshala, Gandhi Bazar, and intermediate at Vijay College, uh, both in Bangalore. Um, moving on, he, did, he got his BE in Mechanical Engineering from University of Vishweshraya College of Engineering in 1953. Uh, this was followed by a diploma in Aeronautical Engineering from ISC in 95 and Associateship of the Indian Institute of Science in 1957, uh, which was under the supervision of Professor Satish Dhawan. And, after that, he did his PhD from Caltech uh, in the areas of uh, aeronautics and physics in 1961. His research interests broadly fall uh, under the topics of fluid dynamics, education and philosophy, history of Indian science, policies and national security. Um, describing a personality 
like him and the remarkable contributions that he has made i am short of words but just um, a, a, an attempt would be to say that he he was the leading researcher in his area of expertise a very well known researcher worldwide an outstanding teacher a dynamic leader and a builder of institutions uh, the intellectual impact of professor narsimha's work has been remarkable and extensive and we'll see all that as we move along in this lecture uh, positions held now uh, professor narsimha's cv if i just have to describe that i think that itself will take a few hours so this is just a brief uh, sort of overview of that so during 1962 to 1993 he was at the aerospace engineering department uh, joining as assistant professor then associate full professor and finally chair uh 1977 to 79 he was chief project coordinator hl um 1982 to 89 he was the convener for center for atmospheric sciences in isc which is now known as center for atmospheric and oceanic sciences uh he was the director of nal from 19 national aerospace laboratories during 1984 to 1993 an honorary professor at isc during 93 to 98 director of national institute of advanced studies during 97 to 2004 and chairman of engineering mechanics unit uh, jawaharlal nehru center for advanced scientific research during 1989 to 2010 uh, during 2009 to 12 he was an adjunct professor at uh, international center for theoretical studies in bangalore uh, dst year of the science professor at uh, jncsr during 13 and 18 and in uh, 2020 um, he was national science chair at jncsr uh besides this he has held various uh, visiting professor positions or honorary professor positions at academy of scientific and innovative research isro university of hyderabad he was also the longest serving member of indian space commission from 1989 to 2012 um positions held abroad of course he had a very close a strong connection with caltech so he was the um, he was a consultant at graduate aerospace lab in 2010 uh, jawala nehru professor at cambridge university during 1989 and 90 um Mil uh, clark b millican visiting professor at caltech in during 85 and 88 where he spent his summers and various other uh, visiting positions at uh, university of adelaide uh, university of glasgow university of brussels and uh, certain other positions at caltech honors of course this is a very very small list of what the, uh, the honors that he has got but still just to point out a few so in 1960 he got the minta martin national student award institute of aerospace sciences usa uh, he was uh, elected fellow of indian academy of sciences in 1972 bhatnagar prize in 1976 and in the same year homi baba award for research in applied sciences he was elected fellow of uh, indian national science academy in 1979 kannada rajyotsava award in 1986 distinguished alumnus uh, caltech in 1986 uh, padma bhushan award uh, uh, india uh, so government of india sorry 1987 fellow of indian national academy of engineering in 1987 distinguished alumnus of iisc 1988 foreign associate national academy of engineering fellow of third world academy of sciences fellow of royal society london fellow of american institute of aeronautics and astronautics for an honorary member of american Ad academy of arts and sciences fluid dynamics award from iia padma vibhushan award by government of india in 2013 and nature mentoring award 2019 uh, best lifetime achievement in india with that very brief intro biographical sketch of professor narsimha I would now like to introduce the panelists we have today in this very fascinating talk. Uh, Dr. Duvuri Subramaniam is an assistant professor of aerospace engineering at the Indian Institute of Science. His research interests are broadly in fluid mechanics and aerodynamics. He obtained a B.Tech in aerospace engineering from IIT Madras in 2010, a, an M.S. In, uh, in space engineering from Caltech in 2011, and a Ph.D. in aeronautics again from Caltech in 2016. He worked as a postdoctoral research associate at Princeton University for two years prior to taking up his present position at ISC. During his B.Tech years, Dr. Subramaniam worked with Professor Rodam Narsimha at JNCSR for three summers and a semester as part of a summer research fellowship program. That work 
resulted in his BTEC project dissertation with Professor Narsimha as the project co-advisor. Um, at today's event, uh, Dr. Subramanyam is going to make a short presentation that will focus on Professor Narsimha's contribution to aerospace research and technology development during the course of his six, day, six decade long career. With that, I move on to introducing the next panelist today, Dr. Saurav S. Divan. Uh, Dr. Saurav Divan obtained his B.E. in Mechanical Engineering from Walchand College of Engineering, Sangli, and M.Sc. Engineering and Ph.D. in Aerospace Engineering from Indian Institute of Science. Thereafter, he spent a few years doing postdoctoral research, first at JNCASR Bengaluru, followed by a stint at Imperial College London. He is presently an ass assistant professor at the Department of Aerospace Engineering and Institute of Science. Uh, his research interests include experimental aerodynamics, transitional and turbulent boundary layers, separated flows, and various flow applications. In today's talk, he will highlight some of the fundamental and pioneering contributions Professor Narsimha made to turbulence research with a particular focus on boundary layers and cumulus clouds. He'll also briefly discuss uh, Professor Narsimha's research attitude and the impressions uh, Dr. Saurav carried during his uh, association with him. I move on to introducing the third uh, panelist today, Dr. M.B. Rajani. Um, Dr. M.B. Rajani is an associate professor at National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. She received the um, Rachapudi Kamakshi Memorial Young Geospatial Scientist Award for her PhD work. She's an elected member of Indian National Young Academy of Sciences, uh, a young affiliate of the World Academy of Sciences and a recipient of PR uh, Pisharoti Memorial Award 2019, given by the Indian Society of Remote Sensing. Um, Dr. Rajni's research has two interrelated facets, analyzing cultural landscapes using geospatial data to identify new features of archeological interest and advancing the usage of such analysis for preserving built heritage in the face of rapidly growing infrastructural development and urbanization. Her primary scientific contribution has been to develop a methodology for detecting telltale signs of past human activities on landscape from satellite imagery and integrating these findings with other spatial data to generate new inferences and novel hypotheses about the past. In today's talk, um, uh, her today's talk is titled Professor Rodam Narsimha Dialogues, Explorations and Interests in Realm of Interdisciplinary Research. Uh, interdisciplinary research involving humanities and history of science. So you can see that there is a, a very diverse set of uh, aspects or facets of Professor Narsimha's research that we'll be touching upon. And with that, I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Duvuri Subramaniam to please uh, deliver his talk. Dr. Subramaniam. Yeah, um... Okay, uh, good morning all. Thanks Ashwini for that introduction. Um, let me just uh, pull up my presentation slides here. Ashwini, can you please confirm that you're able to see the, yes. the slide? Okay, fantastic. All right, uh, good morning again to everyone watching uh, uh, live. So the next 15 minutes, what I'll attempt to do is uh, give an overview um, of some of the challenging uh, problems in aerospace technology development and research that Professor Narsima has worked on over his career that spans almost uh, seven decades. Now, even uh, you know, if I restrict myself to just uh, aspects of his work related to core aerospace technology, I, I find that uh, his, uh, his contributions are, are numerous and wide ranging. So there's no way you know, I can I can cover all that ground in 15 minutes and, and do justice to the same. So instead, what what I'll be doing is I've, I've picked um, you know um, some 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 key um, key problems that that he has worked on, and I'll try to build a story through which you know I want to show that he was uh, indeed the complete aerospace scientist and uh, engineer. All right, um, so let's begin. So. Um, our story now uh, begins, you know, late 1940s, early 1950s, so 70 years ago uh, in Bengaluru, uh, when uh, Rodam Narasimha, or RN for short, uh, was a bachelor's degree student in, in mechanical engineering at uh, University of Vishwasura College of, of Engineering. So at that time, um, he visits uh, uh, IISC, the Indian Institute of Science, on one of its uh, annual open day events. So it's a tradition that we have here on campus where we throw open our labs to, to, the, to the general public. 
so rn uh, comes to isc on on one such uh, occasion and it happens that that year the aerospace engineering department at isc had a spitfire aircraft as an exhibit which they got on on loan from the indian air force uh, for the event now uh, spitfire um, uh, we can see a picture of it uh, at the bottom right it's a you know famous world war 2 era aircraft of the british right um, and uh, you know one of its uh, signature aspects is this uh, elliptic wing which uh, you know i'll come back to so um, you know rn was absolutely fascinated uh, with this aircraft he once told me that this is you know the first time that he is uh, actually gotten that close to an, to an airplane and and touched it right um so uh, you know from the basic uh, theories of aerodynamics uh, you will find that uh, you know elliptic lifting surface is 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 very efficient um and um, i guess as as a mechanical engineering student in those days uh, rn perhaps didn't do uh, formal courses in aerodynamics but he immediately grasped the significance uh, of of you know this this particular shape you know there must he, he guessed that there must be a good sound theory behind it so what i'll do here is just you know quote him uh, uh, directly so this is what he wrote about that that experience um, uh, some years ago so he says what struck me at the time was how smooth and graceful the exterior of the spitfire looked in particular its beautiful elliptic wings but how complicated it was if i looked at the insides which seemed like a jungle of cables pipes ducts valves and so on it seemed astonishing to me that beneath those graceful curves and surfaces which i took to come from mathematics lay hidden a bewildering complex technology and i marveled at those extraordinary people who had apparently mastered both so i think uh, this uh, you know this particular paragraph is is very telling in particular the last uh, sentence i think it contains really the motivation and and method for much of the success uh, extraordinary success really that that rn has seen uh, as an um, aerospace engineer all right so you know after this uh, sort of life changing event uh, you know rn decided that uh, he wanted to pursue aerospace engineering uh, uh, for a career so of course um, you know he comes back to uh, to iisc uh, to the department of aerospace engineering which at that time was the foremost uh, place to do aerospace engineering studies and i suppose it it continues to be the same now uh, he has a picture of you know the main tower building on campus in the 1950s this is how it looked and when rn uh, formally joined the uh, you know the masters program which was then called the diploma in in aeronautical engineering um he this was his you know first encounter with the with the charismatic and legendary uh, satish dawan who was on on the faculty of aerospace engineering so you know this this relationship with 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 dawan with professor dawan had a profound impact on uh, professor nasima's uh, life and you know uh, nasima has written um, extensively about it and unfortunately in this event i will not have time to go into it but to keep it short you know the relationship between the two uh, started as that of a teacher and a student and it it progressed to that of a, a colleague a friend a confidant and you know and davan was a lifelong mentor for uh, professor nasima um all right so um here is another picture of the uh, of both of them uh, this is of course much later uh, i i like this picture because it has a very happy vibe so at at iisc um professor nasima worked uh, closely with davan uh, davan was his uh, research advisor and he worked on uh, he did some seminal work on on boundary layer transition which i uh, i suppose saurav will talk about it uh, talk about in a little more detail during his presentation and he also did um, uh, some some work on high speed wind tunnel development along with the one those are the first set of high speed wind tunnels uh, being built in india at that time so he had a very successful stay at iisc for four years uh, first as a diploma student and then as a and what was then called an associate degree uh, in in aeronautical engineering and at the end of this period uh, davan urged him to to go to caltech to pursue a phd uh, right so it was it was on davan's advice that uh, rn moved from bengaluru Uh, to southern california so pasadena uh, where uh, where caltech is located not very far from uh, the the metropolis of uh, los angeles okay so rn comes to uh, to caltech uh, sometime in late september 1957 so on the slide you see i was able to uh, get a photograph of, of the 
Caltech campus from from that time. It's a it's a pretty campus with the uh, San Gabriel Mountains in the background. And at the bottom of the screen, you know, I was able to pull out uh, a clipping from the Caltech catalog for that year. So the catalog lists all all the PhD students as well. And there you see uh, RN's listing uh, as the Drake Scholar in, in Aeronautics, and it also lists his uh, previous degrees. Uh, so um, aha, another interesting thing here, the, the clipping at the top is from the uh, campus uh, student uh, newspaper. And uh, please pay uh, close attention to the date, October 3rd, 1957. So if you're a space buff, you will realize that this is the eve of a, a really historic landmark event. Because on the next day, October 4th, 1957, uh, USSR launches Sputnik 1, which is the first uh, artificial satellite uh, around Earth uh, to be in Earth's orbit. I mean, this is, like I say, a landmark event. And with the, with the backdrop of the Cold War, it was a nasty surprise uh, for the Americans. Right? So almost overnight, there's a massive shift in research and technology development emphasis from aeronautics to space. Uh, in the US. Uh, and Aran got caught up in the same. So he went to Caltech with the intention of uh, doing work on, on turbulence, um, but instead uh, moved into uh, rarefied gas dynamics, which uh, his advisor also started to take a very keen interest uh, uh, at the time. So this was uh, Professor Hans Liebman, who incidentally also was uh, uh, Professor Satish Dhawan's uh, PhD advisor. So on the right, uh, you know, some pictures of uh, uh, RN from his uh, time at Caltech. Okay, so uh, like I said, um, RN started work on, on a set of problems in, in rarefied gas dynamics, which has to do with uh, a flow of gases uh, at very, very low density. So this is something that you would uh, encounter, say, in the upper atmosphere. So it is of direct relevance to, to space flight. Um, so he worked uh, on the Boltzmann's Boltzmann equations to understand the detailed structure of shock waves and also uh, other related problems of uh, you know, the nature and dynamics of uh, these uh, rarefied gas flows. Um, um, so really fundamental, uh, original and groundbreaking work. And uh, he submits his uh, PhD thesis in, in 1961. Um, so it is no exaggeration to say that at that time, uh, RN was one of the world's leading experts on rarefied gas dynamics, even as a PhD student. And you know, this was evidenced by the fact that even while he was a student, he was engaged as a consultant by multiple uh, aerospace companies uh, that had uh, big contracts from the US government related to space technology development. So, you know, his work was also very directly relevant to uh, aeronautics and in this context, uh, space technology development. So a very productive time at Caltech. And this is a picture of RN at his uh, graduation ceremony. Um, and also here is a picture of RN with his uh, PhD advisor and, you know, a close friend, Hans Liebman. This picture is, of course, uh, uh, you know, perhaps 20 years after his, uh, his uh, PhD time at Caltech. All right. So after that, he um, returns to IIC to join the Faculty of Aerospace Engineering in 1962. Um, this is a picture uh, from a couple of years later in 1964. So at that time, Hans Liebman visits IIC for a year on, on a sabbatical. And this picture is uh, with RN, the extreme left, and Hans second from right, and students uh, in the department at that time who uh, I think took a course that was uh, jointly offered by RN and, and Hans. So at IIC, um, RN starts, you know, uh, a, a big research program um, in, in turbulence, rarefied gas dynamics, and other related areas. Again, Saurabh will touch upon some of these things in his talk. Uh, but I will focus on uh, his involvement in, uh, like I said, aerospace technology problems and, you know, development. So from 1964, we moved uh, now to 1970 when the Indian civil aviation sector had a serious problem. So at the time, Indian Airlines used to fly the Avro 748s uh, for short and medium uh, haul routes. And so it was, it was an important aircraft and they had a fair number of them in their fleet. And in December of 1970, all the pilots uh, that were flying the Avros for Indian Airlines went on a strike saying that they are no longer going to fly the airplane because they deem it to be unsafe. So their chief complaint was that the climb rate of this aircraft was below the rate specified by the British uh, uh, aviation regulations, which 
India followed at that time. In particular, they were concerned that uh, with only one engine, the climb rate was not sufficient for safe flight. Uh, you know, this is this is important because if you have an engine failure during takeoff, you still want to be able to gain altitude with only one engine operational so that you can then make a safe landing. So this was, uh, you know, needless to say, a very serious problem at that time. Uh, and the government appointed uh, Professor Satish Dhawan as a one-man committee to, to look into this airworthiness issues with the arrows. So Dhawan then um, appoints, you know, a, a technical analysis group with people from IIC and, and NAL and I suppose also HAL at the time. Uh, and RN uh, leads that group. So, you know, um, RN spends considerable amount of time going through the airworthiness uh, regulations of the British and trying to understand, uh, you know, the basis for those regulations. And he also looks at the statistics of the arrows from across the world and the accident statistics in particular, and, and sees that, you know, just by looking at the statistics, he doesn't find the Avro to be, you know, any more unsafe than any of the other aircraft flying at the time. So he understands that, you know, there's a deeper issue um, at, at hand. So, uh, you know, over a period of two years, uh, uh, the Avro is subjected to extensive flight tests uh, by, uh, by HL, by one of the uh, very famous um, test pilots. And you know a lot of tests, uh, including uh, you know take um, switching off one engine uh, shortly after takeoff and seeing the climb climb rate and so on. So a lot of data was was collected. So RN you know works uh, through all this data, and you know th this is where he uh, he really um, you know applies his uh, math skill. So he um, comes up with uh, he models this data uh, you know this stochastic data as what what he terms as a stochastic corrective process so this is uh, a new methodology that he introduces to to make sense of all this data so essentially the 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 plot that you see shows you know a typical degradation in, in performance of you know a certain um, uh, component and the corrective process is when you subject it to maintenance or or entire replacement right so he develops this full uh, uh, methodology and you know, crunches through all the data that, that he has and through a bunch of uh, extensive Monte Carlo simulations, uh, convincingly shows that the arrows are indeed uh, safe to fly, right? And many years later, he, he publishes this, this work in, in, in an applied uh, mad journal, journal of the Franklin um, Institute. So this uh, solved the, the Avro problem for, for Indian Airlines uh, at, at that time, you know, with, with uh, RN really uh, leading the way. All right, uh, so we move on now uh, from civil aviation to, to uh, military aviation. Um, and this takes us to the HF-24 Marut, which is the first fighter jet designed and, and built in India. And it was a national project that was started in 1956. Um, so while the jet was designed and built in India, it used the Orpheus 703 engines from Rolls-Royce. Uh, uh, for, for, uh, as a power plant um, and these engines did not have afterburners. Now this was a problem because the Hedge of 24 was intended to be a, a supersonic uh, aircraft, right? It was intended to be a supersonic uh, uh, fighter jet, but without afterburners, it could not achieve, uh, you know, it, it could not uh, be, break through the, the sound barrier. And India did try to get, um, alternate uh, you know engine set of engines from the british with afterburners but it was uh, you know unreasonably expensive at that time so drdo developed uh, a custom built afterburner for the for the office 703 um, engines this was around 1967 1968 but you know retrofitting this uh, afterburners uh, created some serious um, issues in the transonic uh, flight regime Hi, um, so RN was uh, on one of these technical committees uh, to evaluate the, the performance of this afterburner and you know he once narrated to me an, an incident where you know, pretty much a, a fight broke out between the, the, the propulsion design guys and the aerodynamic design guys. So the, the aerodynamics team you know sort of said that the afterburner is not delivering enough thrust and that's why you're not able to uh, you know uh, go through the transonic regime. Uh, whereas the propulsion group said that, you know, it's the modified airframe that is creating uh, too much drag. That's why we are not able to go supersonic. So, you know, RN uh, decided to settle this in, in, a, in a very objective manner. Um, so he performed what at that time were very uh, sort of uh, advanced uh, numerical calculations to uh, accurately evaluate the transonic drag that was created by this uh, modified airframe. 
to which you know the uh, autobahn was fit um, and you know through this calculation he very clearly showed that indeed the uh, the the transonic wave drag had had significantly gone up because of the modifications uh, to the airframe again this at that time in 1970 was not a trivial uh, calculation to do and the algorithm that uh, rn dollop was uh, very advanced at the time and better than better performing than anything else that, that existed uh, all right um, so uh, with that experience you know the hs24 was sort of uh, uh, you know that 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 project was starting to to die down and then a few years later in 1977 um, there was another attempt made called the hs25 to use russian engines with with uh, afterburners um, you know and this for this effort rn uh, was uh, formerly the chief project coordinator and we worked with a team of engineers from uh, hl and and nal now during this effort um, a year later in 1978 the government sort of made a snap decision to to buy the jaguars from from the british and the french and the hf25 project was dropped now this came as a as a disappointment uh, for rn because he felt that the hf24 was actually you know ahead of its time um, uh, uh, and uh, you know except for the for the for the engine um, so here is the uh, you know plan forms of uh, both those aircraft uh, so pose so you can see that both in terms of the scale and the shape uh, they are remarkably uh, similar Uh, so important thing to note here is that the jaguar uh, the design work on the jaguar started about 9 years after the the hf 24 um so in any case uh, this whole experience got rn thinking from a very um, uh, fundamental uh, view point about india's requirements uh, uh, for for the next generation uh, fighter aircraft um again i um, show here verbatim uh, from an account that rn uh, wrote of those days and i'm just going to quickly read uh, what he says Uh, using the lessons learned on the hf25 project i concluded that from a strategic point of view we need about 100 200 aircraft to make the project economically viable and excellent point performance so that it could engage in combat with the best aircraft that our adversaries might have without the need for a heavy payload or long range this should be effective in at least one of the two friends that india has had to face okay now to emphasize this concept he calls this the light combat aircraft and discusses this with an informal chat group that that consists of professor davan dr valuri who was then the director of uh, nal and uh, mr raj mahindra who was the md of uh, design at hl and he was the junior member after a few discussions um, uh, it was concluded that it was an excellent idea worth pursuing so the hl 25 group became the lca group so this was really the the origin um, story of the lca okay i see that i'm uh, running late on time so i'll i'll quickly speed up through the rest of the slides um so i'll skip this so here's a a photograph of uh, you know the the first report that was prepared by rn and raj mahindra on the lca and that was uh, submitted to the air force and it got a very positive response so um, rn worked very closely with the air force from that point on to to fully develop this concept and you know a lot of Uh, effort went into this uh, over a period of 4 to 5 years and finally when it was uh, uh, submitted to the government formally uh, it was accepted in you know very short time right and the lca project uh, was was formally born so here's a, a picture that shows the two famous narasimhas uh, pv narasimha rao who was then the defense minister and and uh, rodam narasimha so rn explains the uh, the lca concept to uh, narasimha rao all right now at the end of that period so at 80 in in the year 1984 uh, rn goes to nl as its director and you know has a very productive 9 uh, years there leading uh, several many efforts um this slide is sort of a very concise summary of it um, again uh, in the interest of time i will not be able to uh, spend uh, say more on this uh, and he finally retires in in, in 1993 uh, from uh, from nl so this is a nice picture uh, at 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 the farewell organized for professor nasima in 93 um okay so with that uh, we'll quickly switch gears and and move to you know his contributions to space uh, in india so uh, aslv suffered two uh, uh, failures uh, the first two flights of aslvs were failures and there was significant pressure on isro at that time to Uh, uh to to get this right so the then chairman of isro professor yuvarao uh, requests rn to head the external review panel 
and uh, you know usually these kind of failures are very very complicated and you have a lot of data and to to make sense of all this data rn uh, you know really drew upon his uh, um, his extraordinary analytical skills to identify a series a host of problems in both the aerodynamics and controls of the vehicle and within a year all the the problem areas were identified and and they were fixed so here's a quote from uh, uh, kasuri rangan who was later the chairman of isro for many years uh, on rn's involvement and soon after this you know rn was appointed to india space commission and he, like ashwini mentioned he was longest serving uh, member on the space commission so as part of the space commission you know he was really uh, not only at a policy level but he was also involved uh, at a technical level you know helping isro with various problems so i think i think they benefited tremendously from uh, from his involvement in their program um okay so i will skip this in the interest of time uh, and i will uh, before i finish i just want to point out one thing so um rn has won numerous uh, international and national uh, uh, honors of various kinds but there's one thing that i want to highlight here which is the aaa fluid dynamics award so this award was instituted uh, in the year 1976 and today they to date they have been about 45 awardees and it is interesting to note that out of the 45 uh, rn is the only non american to be to be awarded this so the other 44 are all uh, american researchers and engineers so i think his his work has also uh, had a strong impact on the on the international scene um so with that i i i think i will finish because i'm i'm running short on time and uh, maybe towards the end i can come back to to these slides all right yeah thanks ashwini thanks subramanian for that fascinating taking us through this fascinating journey uh, i would now invite uh, dr saurav devan to please go ahead okay um, so let me share my screen so can you can you see this ashwin i think it's coming up but uh, not yet not yet sir okay i'm sorry i think there was some glitch yeah can you try again please yes i will just share it sorry about that okay so can you see this yes okay so um, good morning everyone and i'll just uh, take the baton from um, subramanyam and talk about to nasima's pioneering contributions to turbulence research um so if you look at the landscape of professor nasima's research in fluid dynamics it, it's an ex expansive uh, landscape and it would be futile to uh, you know try to uh, discuss all of these um themes that he uh, worked on so i will just choose three broad themes and also among these i will just pick up on one representative problem and give you a glimpse into the kind of uh, pioneering research he did um so before i do that i would just like to uh, you know uh, talk about two basic concepts and i will keep it as simple as possible uh, so bear with me if it gets a bit too technical for you so first is the concept of boundary layer uh, which is formed on any solid surface when there is a relative motion between fluid and uh, solid surface and a thin layer is formed on the surface of the solid surface uh, where the velocity shows a rapid variation from zero at the surface to a certain velocity so if you call this thickness of the boundary layer to be delta it is much small as compared to the length of the body l and this concept was proposed by ludwig pantel 
and this brought about a revolution in the study of fluid flows and the second concept is that of flow turbulence so you can classify flows into two types typically a laminar flow and a turbulent flow a laminar flow is the one which is kind of regular orderly and you can imagine it as you know fluid layers moving on top of each other like a deep uh, river moving at a slow pace on the other hand turbulent flow is highly irregular chaotic you know involving a lot of mixing and dispersion unsteady etc and you can liken it to um, a shallow rocky river moving at a at a fast speed and you can see this difference when you open uh, you know your kitchen sink tap uh, a, a, a little bit to get a laminar flow and if you open it fully you will see a turbulent flow and turbulent flow is uh, difficult to solve mathematically and hard to understand physically and there are many colorful descriptions uh, of this phenomenon so richard feynman the great maverick scientist of uh, 20 um, 20th century called it the last un unresolved problem of classical physics and another well known uh, fluid dynamicist sir horace lamb in 1920s or 30s uh gave this famous quote where he said i am an old man now so when i die i would like to ask god about enlightenment on two problems so there were early days of quantum uh, mechanics so quantum electrodynamics and turbulence and he was rather optimistic about the former but not so much about the latter so it's not a surprise that uh, person asimma or uh, again rn as he was known to his associates was attracted to this problem now the switch between laminar and turbulent flows is not sudden and it happens over a certain uh, distance which is called as uh, flow transition so this boundary layer would be called as transitional boundary layer um and if you stick a velocity probe into this and look at how the signal looks like uh, you will find that part of the time the signal looks laminar whereas part of the time these turbulent patches appear and serious research on this really started in early 1950s with the work of imons and then you can characterize this as an intermittent signal so i will just be sketchy about this but i have given more details on the slides for those who are interested so um as subramanya mentioned uh, it was 1955 that rn joined as an uh, uh, for an associate degree with professor satish dhawan so those were early days of transition research and he looked at the available uh, literature at that time so imons had in fact proposed a theory where he said that these turbulent spots or the patches of turbulence are formed everywhere over the transition zone so that was his hypothesis but then when i when arin looked at a comparison of this theory with available experiments he found that there was a clear discrepancy so he came up with an alternative hypothesis what he called as concentrated breakdown where he hypothesized that uh, this breakdown into turbulent spots is not really distributed but is concentrated over a relatively narrow region around the you know the, the location where the transitional boundary layer onsets and with this he was able to uh, make a, a favorable comparison of his theoretical curve with the the experimental data obtained from variety of different uh, conditions and you can see here two sets of experiments one from united states and the other made uh, here at iisc and that resulted in two publications one uh, you know a single author publication you can imagine a young uh, masters graduate uh, you know uh, publishing a single author paper so those in the business will understand the value of it and the second with uh, satish dhawan and the experiments in the iisc wind tunnel were in fact made in a 20 inch by 20 inch boundary layer wind tunnel which was built by dhawan around 1955 and this shows the sketch of it and this is the photograph of this boundary layer at present which is nearly 65 years down the line and uh, surprisingly uh you know and wonderfully this tunnel is still operational it it you know apart from a few modifications it is more or less the same as 
um, Dhawan baked it in 1950s and still continues to give uh, you know the, the kind of flow quality for which it was designed. So, uh, so currently um, it's under my charge, and we are doing research on transitional and turbulent bungalows. And these are some of the um, snapshots from a poster Aaron prepared on his early work, which adorns uh, one of the walls uh, in this low-speed aerodynamics lab. And as Pramanjam said, uh, he considered. Uh, Satish Dhawan as his guru, and he turned out to be his true shishya. So he paid rich tributes to him whenever opportunities arose. Arendt continued working on this problem, and over the next several years, several decades, really, he revisited this problem. Uh, you know, uh, as late as 2017, he in fact uh, did uh, 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 some research. For extending his ideas to hypersonic boundary layers in collaboration with the University of Queensland. So this you know, work on transition boundary layers is really considered as a landmark work and a pioneering work in the studies on uh, transitional boundary layers. And in fact, it had resulted in uh, considerable development of the transitional models, which are necessary for uh, doing realistic engineering problems. So the second problem I would like to discuss is that of a fully turbulent boundary layer. And that is realized when this transition is complete and you know the, the, the character of the velocity field or the velocity signal becomes turbulent all the time. Now a turbulent boundary layer is a complex object and you can look at it as layers within a layer. So if you open up or zoom into the turbulent boundary layer, you will see an inner layer and an outer layer each with its own uh, dynamical behavior. And in this intermediate layer, these two descriptions match. This is somewhat similar to uh, the picture or the painting by Sky uh, by MC Isher called Sky and Water, where you see fish deep in the sea and birds high in the sky. But the interface between the two, you see both the shapes, you know, the birds as well as the fish. You know, this is one. Um, pictorial way of imagining what might be happening. So if you look at how this turbulence is produced in a turbulent boundary layer, it typically happens close to the wall. But then this turbulence is not produced all the time uniformly. And again, uh, somewhat similar to the turbulent spots that I uh, discussed earlier, this production of turbulence occurs in intermittent bursts of activity. And because this happens close to the wall, the conventional wisdom uh, said that these parameters associated with this phenomenon should depend on the inner variables or characteristics of the inner layer. But Arun, in his landmark paper with his co-workers, in fact found that if you look at the average period between two uh, successive bursts, that actually depends upon the outer variables which is the boundary layer thickness and the velocity uh, at the edge of the outer layer. So there's a considerable interaction between the inner and the outer layer, and they're not really uh, entirely distinct, which turned out to be a prophetic insight. And in fact, almost um, 40 years later, uh, this, this inner outer interaction has, has turned out to be an important theme uh, in, in the modern developments in uh, wall turbulence. So this work generated a lot of interest, but it also became quite controversial because people found it hard to believe that, you know, something happens close to the wall can so directly depend on the dynamics of the outer layer. Uh, Arun, you know, uh, gathered further evidence to support uh, his ideas. And for that, he turned to the atmospheric boundary layer, which is formed on the surface of the earth because of its spinning motion. And in fact, uh, he devised an indigenous field campaign. So he was instrumental in conceiving, designing, and implementing it, where a, a team from um, IISC, NAL, and IIT in Pune, they built and erected these measurement towers. And then they carried out measurement of velocity, temperature, humidity. Uh, and this was uh, you know, the first such field campaign uh, designed um, in India. And then he spent several years after that looking at the data obtained from this. Uh, so that was the second problem I wanted to discuss. Finally, 
I will come to uh, the problem of cumulus clouds. Now, cumulus cloud is one type of clouds which are typically found uh, in tropics. So, and then this is this is a common view in India. If you look up at at, at uh, the sky, especially during pre-monsoon periods, the the summer uh, uh, time, then you will see these bubbly, heap-like you know, uh, clouds with sharp edges, constantly modifying vigorous convection and they appear in different shapes. So one is a cauliflower type and the other is a tower type. Um, now Aaron's interest in cumulus clouds was partly motivated by his interest in monsoon dynamics. So he was deeply interested in Indian monsoons and wanted to understand and predict this, it better because you know agriculture depended so heavily on the rainfall prediction. But also he was fascinated as a child uh, you know, uh, by these, these fascinating clouds, which are called as the queen of the tropical sky. And here is a cartoon by B.G. Gunjarappa, where the, the young Narsimha is sky gazing, probably looking at cumulus clouds and receiving a, a rebuke from a stern elderly uh, person. Uh, so this fascination and wonder he felt about clouds continued and remained with him throughout his life. Uh, so the idea that RN came up with was to simulate this cumulus cloud flows in the laboratory. And the idea behind that can be understood if we uh, consider how a cumulus cloud is formed in atmosphere. So it really starts with a hot spot on the surface of the earth, which results in a vertical current of air called as a turbulent plume. This is the kind of flow which is generated when you light an agarbatti. Um, and then because air is uh, moist, it contains water vapor, above a particular altitude because of reduced temperature, the water vapor condenses and forms a, a, you know, a collection of tiny droplets, which is when you start seeing this white appearance for the cloud. But this also releases what is called as latent heat of condensation, which enhances the buoyancy of this air, but it also considerably modifies the turbulence structure. And this was the aspect which was overlooked by previous researchers. And that became a point of focus uh, for RN's um, early investigations, which of course continued over two or three decades. So this is the apparatus which he conceived um, and developed. And the development started in 1980s in the Center of Atmospheric Sciences, and then moved out to JNC ASR. And this is the photograph of the apparatus in 2010. So this was around the time when I joined as a postdoc to work with RN. And Subramanian was already working there for his uh, final year project. And this is the team who worked on it. Uh, so the idea was to generate a plume uh, in this water tank and then add heat to it by passing current uh, through this conducting water. And the water is made conducting by adding some acid to it. So believe it or not, but the stimulus clouds were actually made in a water tank. And uh, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's a fascinating story in itself, but I will not go into that right now. So with that, we were able to generate a variety of cumulus cloud forms. So here I've shown some comparison pictures from A to E, where the left image is a real cloud, atmospheric cloud. And the red cloud is the one obtained in the lab using a red dye. And you can see that there's a striking resemblance between the two. Not only static shapes, but also an entire evolution of clouds was captured. And I'll quickly show you um, half a minute video for that. So if you see this, this plume is coming out and this is where the cloud is forming. So first you see this cauliflower shaped cloud, which then rises like a tower. Finally, this plume is turned off. So it becomes an isolated cloud continues to rise. It hits this surface, which is actually a heated layer. So it's called as an inversion in the language of atmospheric science. It spreads. So it changes its type from congestus to alto cumulus and high altitude cloud. And then an irregular descent starts, you know, with time, which is called as a cumulus fractus. So we were able to simulate the entire lifetime of cumulus clouds in this apparatus. Um, and then we identified the important uh, parameters, which are, you know, uh, the heat addition, 
how the heat changes with time and how it is distributed in space, which is sort of shown here. Um, Arun also wanted to create this uh, cloud flows on computer. So this led to the development of computer cores, which are called as Mega. And there are five versions available from Mega 1 to Mega 5, which is the latest version. There are several students and postdocs who in fact contributed to both lab and computer simulations. And here we show some fake cloud generated on the computer. So Hi, Saurav. Success, yeah, sure. Sorry to interrupt you. We are at uh, around 17 minutes mark. So. Yeah, sure. So I'll just take a couple of minutes. So, you know, this now has enabled detailed investigations to be carried out on the, the scientific issues. So I, I will stop here, but maybe in the next a minute or so, I will uh, just give a glimpse uh, of the mind of Rodham Nasima, the kind of impressions which I carried with my association. I'll keep it brief, maybe come back to it at the end. So Aaron could hold a research problem in his mind for a long time, you know, and not, not really be impatient about it. He could look at it from all angles, mull over it, and grasp the entire scope of it. He was always cautious interpreting results and arriving at conclusions. So he wanted his statements to be accurate, if not precise. Reasoning was a prominent feature of his intellect. He always advised us to look at principles behind you know, solving even highly practical matters like leaking of pipes. He was able to work effortlessly on a variety of problems and all it uh, you know, uh, uh, was important for him was that the problem should be interesting. It didn't matter whether it was fashionable or not. He was very meticulous in writing and he commented profusely. So here you see uh, one of the drafts I had prepared last year and he had marked his comments on it. He raised the consciousness of those around him to aspire for higher things, but did that quite gently. And until very end, he did not lose his curiosity. And in fact, few months before his passing away, he was ready to embark upon a new project, a two-year project, to use the codes which were developed for the cumulus clouds to studying the cough and sneeze flows, which are generated uh, um, you know, from a person coughing or sneezing with relevance to this COVID-19 pandemic. On a personal uh, front, he was a cheerful personality, always approachable. Uh, excellent storyteller, and although he was a highly decorated scientist, he carried that weight lightly, so it was always comfortable to be in company with him. So uh, I think it is um, undoubtedly true that he created an unparalleled legacy in fluid mechanics research in India, at par with best in the world. And I'll just stop with this, this statement I wrote uh, in an obituary on RN, uh, I recently uh, uh, wrote. So it was as if RN had carved out a space around him by his intellectual austerity, and there was a certain sanctity associated with it. One could not but get touched by it if one's mind was sensitive enough. So every time I met him, I felt this quality about him and got inspired and refreshed by connecting with it. So that that's, you know, summarizes my uh, impression of the, the, the time I spent with him. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, and then I look forward to interacting uh, at the end of these uh, presentations. Thanks, Sora, okay. for this uh, fascinating presentation, covering some of the details and also the personal attributes and your experience of working with Professor Narsimha. Um, I'll now invite uh, Dr. Rajini to please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwini. Uh, can you just confirm that uh, my slides are visible? Yes. I'm just trying to make it full screen. One second. Yeah. Yes, it is perfect. Thank you. Uh, so I have titled my uh, presentation as Dialogues um, and his interest in the realm of interdisciplinary research and uh, covering history of science and humanities. Um, uh, uh, you, but you know what I feel with, uh, which is already clear from other presentations. Also, these uh, titles or labels, history of science or humanities or Sanskrit, are just uh, keywords, and it really doesn't cover uh, what um, uh, Professor Narsema stood for and his interests in fu fully. Uh, my presentation is going to cover his time in NIAS. Uh, and uh, um, uh, highlighting some of the volumes uh, he was uh, involved in reviewing and uh, editing, and also the processes that uh, 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 led to these volumes. 
Uh, a brief history, National Institute of Advanced Studies was conceived and established by the vision and initiative of um, J.R.D. Tata. Part of his vision was to create an institution uh, which would conduct advanced research in multidisciplinary areas. Our founding director was uh, Dr. Raja Ramanna and uh, Professor Rodam Narsima took over in 1997. Uh, here is a, um, um, a a publication a book, uh, Science and Beyond, which was published in 2005. But uh, the programs that led to publishing this book happened earlier. An international symposium was held at NIAS in January 2003 on science and beyond cosmology, consciousness, and technology in Indic tradition in collaboration with uh, Center of Theology and Natural Sciences in Berkeley. Here is a picture of the inauguration of uh, this program. Um, this dialogue, uh, this, uh, this was to promote dialogue among leading scientists on the connections between their scientific work and their religious or spiritual conviction and ideas. It drew together the most distinguished Indian scientists, philosophers, and other scholars, as well as their colleagues from the rest of the world. Presentations, panels, and public lectures by Nobel laureates, such as Charles Towns, uh, uh, British astrophysicist Roger Penrose and uh, world-renowned primatologist Jane Goodall were few of the people who came for these um, for this uh, event and participated. And of also, uh, Professor Narsema had uh, interacted with them while um, editing this volume, reviewing, editing, and editing this volume. Uh, he contributed a paper himself the fundamental problems of human action, where he says to understand what is beyond science, it uh, is necessary to see human action on, uh, um, uh, you know, the knowledge and action of human beings. To attempt to answer this question, he says, we may begin by noting man's relation with the rest of the universe. People, objects, nature are mediated through knowledge and action. This idea has a long Indic history and can do no better than quote one of the verses from the Yoga Vashishta. So this verse in translation says, it takes both of its wing for a bird to fly about in the sky. So it takes both knowing and doing for man to perfect himself. I'm not an expert in this subject, but uh, another uh, quotation that he uses while describing man's action uh, I came across this quotation, which I feel it is something he himself stood by and probably imparted to most people he was in touch with. It, this is from Bhagavad Gita, which says, you have authority only over your action, not ever over its fruits. So let not reward be cause for action, but don't be attached to inaction either. This also reminded me when Saurabh was saying that he was very patient with his ideas taking long time and so on. So very soon after this event, uh, not too long after this event, um, uh, Rodam Narasimha stepped down um, uh, from NIAS, uh, being the director of NIAS, which is in March 2004. And uh, it was so strange that I first joined NIAS only about a week uh, before he left um, as director. But um, NIAS was very small then and small enough that uh, even in that week, uh, there was opportunities to sit across table with uh, Professor uh, Aaron and have teas and coffees with him and uh, start up a rapport that I could take along, even though I was never uh, actually in any formal kind of mentorship with him. Following uh, uh, that year, there was um, um, two, uh, uh, the following years, there were two important workshops that happened in NIAS, which led to publication of this book, Nature and Culture. Uh, which was as part of a uh, project on history of Indian science, philosophy, and culture of Center of Studies and Civilization. There were two brainstorming sessions in 2004 and 5. This picture is just indicative of some, the kind of people who were part of this uh, uh, event or the, these two events. There were historians, there were philosophers, there were Vedic um, uh, scholars like Fritz Stoll over here. Uh, Professor D.K. Chattopadhyay, philosopher, Professor Shetter, historian, um, uh, Shadav Dani Ganesh, who's a, a Sanskritist, and there were scientists, uh, astrophysicists, and biologists, uh, whom all of you probably can easily recognize. So in his introduction, long introduction for this book, he lays out what this uh, discussion was intended to do. Uh, so I'll just uh, read a few lines from it. 
so uh, the discussion was to question to what extent are Indic cultures influenced by the environment in different parts of the country and in India as a whole? Is there a common thread connecting all of them that could constitute the Indic culture? How have similar environmental features operated in cultures in other parts of the world? To what extent do Indic views of nature influence our culture and are in turn influenced by it? In cosmology, astronomy, mathematics, technology, the sciences in general, what are the connection between sacred art and so on? So you can see how uh, it was a very wide ranging um, idea and uh, the, it involved uh, interacting with uh, people really a top experts from across uh, the world in many fields. Uh, in this volume, he has uh, 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 contributed a, an article, apart from the long introduction, an article um, which is Culture Views Nature, Bacon and Sankhya Compared, where he compares two influential thinkers, one a 17th century British philosopher and statesman, statesman, patron saint of modern science, the inspiration of Royal Society of London, and another uh, who we only know by his uh, the work, uh, whose philosophy goes back 3000 years. Uh, as part of uh, uh, the uh, discussions that led to this book, there was Professor Fritz Stoll who visited Nias quite often uh, between late 90s and till 2006. Uh, we have a lot of formal pictures of Professor Raran and uh, Fritz Stoll, but what we don't have pictures are of um, weeks and uh, you know weeks and uh, hours and weeks. Professor Raran and Professor Fritz Stoll would sit across this table here along the corridor and have discussions of common interest. Uh, I would like to mention another person who contributed to this volume, Professor uh, John Marr. He wrote on flora and Sangam poetry in this volume. And uh, during his discussion with Professor Narsimha, they also discovered they had a common interest in spitfire. And it just so happens, Professor Narsimha, uh, Dr. Marr was in Bangalore in 2000, sorry, 1946, uh, where spitfire was uh, 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 displayed in Yalahanka. And, uh, Professor uh, Narasimha fondly remembered that that must have been the earliest that he would have seen a spitfire. Then coming to the last of the books that uh, I'm going to talk today uh, is this uh, Encyclopedia and Clas Classical Indian Sci Sciences. He edited this with Helen Silling. And it's also interesting to note that they both met in a conference uh, a few years before and decided to work on this project on uh, classical Indian sciences. Helen Selene also came to NIAS and spent over a month. Uh, again, uh, a lot of the discussion that has gone into this book happened in the corridors of NIAS. A uh, few things uh, that he discusses why this book came about. Um, it's, uh, he says it's extraordinary and uh, uh, the, uh, because of the, 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 given the extraordinary and widespread curiosity in India about its own scientific knowledge, it is re remarkable that there is not enough books to feed to such curiosity. And he details about all the uh, things that India was uh, in the forefront in science and technology, such as brick making, metal making, and so on, metal technology and so on. And uh, then he also says, just like the study of the historian, history of Indian mathematics itself has been suffering from two kinds of preoccupation, namely the Indian nationalism and Hellenism, because of exaggerations on both sides, a fair and authentic account of the history of Indic sciences has been difficult to find. He says that was the inspiration that uh, um, uh, the, in the introduction of this book, he says, our objective in this encyclopedia is to provide an authentic an account as possible of what is actually known and widely expect, uh, accepted today about the Indic sciences by scholars across the world. There are 111 articles on various topics, which Aaron has authored on, among which Aaron has authored uh, on atomism and rockets. Coming to rockets, uh, Tipu Sultan's rockets has been his, uh, in a way, pet passion. It's not, I mean, in, in, in the process of studying Tipu Sultan's rocket, he, he got involved in studying the milieu, uh, the science, the technology, the, uh, why, was, why did Tipu do it, not someone else, Tipu's background, his philosophy, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is an article he first uh, wrote uh, for Nature. Uh, here are some slides from a, uh, um, from a talk he gave at the 150th anniversary of the Archaeological Survey of India. 
he shared these uh, slides with me at the time. Um, uh, here are pictures of the Tipu's rockets, only two extant uh, uh, some um, specimens which are in, uh, um, in the museums in London. Here are some paintings showing how they were handled. And here are some analysis uh, of uh, why they came to be made in South India because of the availability of raw material, because of the technology of the time and so on. Uh, and here is a map that shows uh, its use. I mean, um, occasions of its, its use around Sri Ranpatna Fort. This is where I got involved in some work with him, where he said, if I could work on um, uh, finding uh, authentic maps of uh, this event of uh, war at Sri Rangpatna, and if I can identify those places uh, and measure the distance between where the rocket would have been launched and where it would have been landed. So that's what I did. Uh, this was a map that I was able to later find. And uh, this is re uh, referencing these uh, places marked in this map and records, and then measure uh, the distance from where the rockets would have been launched and where they landed. And Rudam Narsimha didn't necessarily, I mean, he, he really believed that uh, true scholarship can come from anywhere. Uh, here is an example. He uh, was, uh, his two good friends, Malika and uh, Ram Kamartam in the background here, they are theater artists. Uh, he uh, was in touch with them and encouraged them to go on a scholarship to England and see these rockets. And uh, they uh, wrote a play on this whole process. And uh, he incubated, he arranged for them to incubate this play, play at Nia. By incubate, I mean uh, they um, got artists together and spent time in the uh, auditorium at Nia's to discuss how it, it's going to pan out and finally did a play reading. Here are some pictures of this play reading, uh, Professor Narsima giving an introduction to how this whole uh, the uh, research for this play was done and, uh, and uh, also answering some questions at the end. Um, another personal uh, uh, involvement, two years ago, um, two, three years ago, Karnataka government had announced that they want to drop uh, any lessons concerning Tipu Sultan from textbooks. And of course, media got to Professor Narsimha to give his inputs. He said, it's not enough for me to give my inputs, you should get some young people. So he put together scholars uh, from various institutions in Bangalore to have a debate over whether what, what, what is to be done with this proposition. And uh, this happened at his residence or just outside his residence with some chai and biscuits and very warm um, uh, discussions. Uh, with this, uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention last two public lectures he gave at NIAS, one on the NIAS's logo, uh, which has its uh, um, uh, uh, history um, to, uh, in Sulva Shastra. He wrote an article about it uh, as, probably as soon as he became uh, director at NIAS uh, long ago. And his last public lecture was in January 2000, uh, 2020 uh, on algorithms and uh, a view of mathematics, uh, of Indic mathematics, algorithms or axioms, a view of Indic mathematics. With that, uh, I would uh, like to end my lecture and uh, also mention that uh, he probably will be remembered most for his, um, uh, for his contributions to the uh, sciences that are more formal sciences because he has a lineage of people, but his interest, his commitment and uh, his, uh, depth uh, uh, to these his, uh, uh, areas of history of sciences and humanities were also equal. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rajni, for taking us through this very interesting aspect of uh, Professor Narsimha's research and interests. Um, we are um, running late on schedule, but we do have some time for uh, some comments and discussions at the end. Um, okay. Um, I had just a few things in my mind. I thought I'll just uh, bring it to the floor. Um, so uh, Subramaniam, you were mentioning about the wing design and some of that you couldn't really uh, go into details because of lack of time. So would you like to tell us more about his... Uh, uh, fascination with the elliptic uh, wing form and then later on the de uh, the designs that he did 
Yeah, Ashwini, yes. As I was afraid, you know, there's uh, there's never enough time to <laughs> talk about Professor Nasima. So I couldn't, uh, you know, uh, go through that slide. Uh, maybe I'll just quickly uh, share my screen again. Um, to Yes, please. Uh, to show just that one slide. Um, so, you know, uh, I thought since I began the story with uh, Aaron's fascination of the elliptic wing on the Spitfire, I thought it would be fitting to, to talk briefly about, you know, some work that he did uh, towards the you know, end of his career, again, coming back to wings. Um, now, civil uh, aircrafts has, you know, India making its own um, civilian aircraft has been a long-standing uh, dream of uh, Professor Nasim and actually uh, work towards uh, realizing it and uh, connected to that uh, you know um, a project that he undertook uh, is to optimize the the wing design uh, for a propeller driven aircraft where you have the propeller slip stream right so this is not the free stream flow uh, coming in to the wing uh, you know which would give to a certain give rise to a certain optimal shape but now parts of the wing also see the swirl from the propeller um, so there was a <clears throat> uh, there was an effort to to optimize uh, the wing uh, for for these kind of aircrafts, and you know this work was was published uh, in in the AAWA Journal of Aircraft, and RN and co-workers also got a, a, a patent for this. So it it sort of shows that he was uh, you know very serious uh, about uh, you know putting this to to practical use. So uh, someday I hope you know we can realize our own uh, you know, civilian aircraft, and you know. Wing designs like this can can be implemented. Um, I also want to uh, take just another minute to show something that I had uh, missed earlier. Uh, that is that uh, recently in in March, NL has uh, named their uh, civil aircraft center as the Rodan Nasima Civil Aircraft Center as a small tribute to to RN's contribution. So I thought that was a very uh, nice gesture. Yeah. Thanks, Subramaniam. Um, Saurav, so, I was, um, we are all very curious to know the, the two aspects of uh, Professor Narsima being deep into theoretical studies and also uh, into experiments. So can you tell us a bit about uh, how he went about these two complementary things and if you have something more to say on that, mm. we'd love to okay. hear on that. So, um, as, as I said, his uh, career started with, uh, you know, the work he did with uh, Professor Satish Dhawan. And there itself, you can see both the elements, uh, wherein, you know, he looked at the existing theory, which was proposed at that time, and he put it upon it. But at the same time, he also did experiments, uh, you know, to compare the outcome of that theory with uh, the experimental data. And I think this, uh, and then of course, uh, on the later uh, um, development of his work, this also got a contribution from computational work where you solve these equations of motion on computer and not just on, uh, you know, with, with uh, pen and paper. So uh, because of the kind of uh, uh, character which the discipline of fluid dynamics carries, one really, really has to rely a lot, especially uh, you know, um, subject like turbulence. One has to rely uh, very heavily on uh, experiments, either in the lab or on the computer, to look at how the flow behaves. But at the same time, it's also necessary to come up with some um, generalized scientific principles to, in fact, to be able to describe it in a theoretical framework. So if you look at his work, throughout his 60 years of research in fluid mechanics. Even at uh, Caltech during his PhD, he work, worked on Boltzmann uh, equation that was theoretical slash numerical work, also did experiments there. And after he returned to India and this one skill that he picked up there, which was the method of um, matched asymptotic expansions, which is you know a technique, mathematical technique, which is used when you have a small parameter in the problem or large parameter like Reynolds number being large. And then throughout his career at IIC and JNC, he always combined these. So if you look at the problems, uh, you know, th there is a definite experimental aspect to it in wind tunnels or in water tanks. But there's also, you know, these ideas of 
um, um, asymptotic analysis or the so-called rapid distortion, or even for the problem of pre-laminarization, for which he is quite well known, he developed a quasi-laminar theory to, in fact, predict the behavior. So, relaminarization is a condition where turbulent flow goes back to laminar flow. So he, you know, he thought that uh, what was um, important to be able to tackle the physical problem at hand, and he was willing to use any necessary tool, you know, whether his experiments, theory, or computations, to be able to tackle it uh, in an intelligent and successful way. So that uh, you know was. Um, and in the age of specializations where you know one specializes only in one particular area, I think he set an example wherein you should really diversify so that you can do justice to the uh, research problem at hand. So that's what really his approach was towards doing research. Thanks, Saurav. And we also have a comment uh, from Venkat that RN pioneered the use of hybrid computing in uh, elucidating flows around uh, turbine blocks. All right, um, uh, Rajini, I, this was very interesting about Indic traditions and the tendency to take the extreme approach uh, while analyzing uh, these things. So um, you think after Professor Narsimha's time or on, on these uh, studies and issues, there is greater intensity and uh, sort of scrutiny of and studies of Indic traditions in particularly in science. Um, you mean at NIAS? Yes. yes. And otherwise yes, um, the overall landscape of yes, uh, Indology and Indic traditions. Well, uh, um, at uh, for, uh, first of all, I'm not necessarily an expert in this, but at NIAS itself, most of the things I uh, showed you uh, as publications, they have happened since. I mean, um, even the conferences that ha they have happened since he stepped down. Um, so he was very much there. He was an emeritus professor. He used to come more frequently, not so much in the last few years, but uh, he, uh, he came more frequently, uh, conducted the programs. His vision has actually given uh, rise to several um, research programs in uh, at NIAS, one of them being Consciousness Studies Program, uh, International Study, Strategic Studies Program, uh, and also Heritage Science and Society Program and things like that. So there are uh, groups, uh, not, and uh, I'm not fully sure about uh, the overall um, uh, uh, you know, uh, there are other other places he he has uh, played a great role in uh, um, the for instance the Journal of History of Sciences and there there are a whole lot of people working there. But uh, um, uh, what I mean to say is. Um, uh, Unlike the formal sciences, you don't have necessarily an institution, a group of people who take off and can uh, further his work straight away. So that, therefore, I meant that there is lineage in other formal sciences uh, and not necessarily in this, but, uh, you know, and therefore, in some ways, it is very, uh, his contribution to these fields are um, very important. Thanks, Rajini. Um, yeah. Uh... Okay, I uh, will just take two more minutes to share something very interesting and fascinating for all of us, uh, INIAS members and our audience. Um, in a very popular uh, article in Current Science in 2014, uh, two of uh, Professor Narsimha's very well-known students, Professor G.S. Burt and K.R. Sinivas, and they wrote an article and towards the end, there were some maxims that they have sort of come up with interpreting Professor Narsimha's uh, sort of impression on them growing as uh, scientists. So I would just like to take a couple of minutes and show that to uh, all of you. Uh, and I'll just share my screen and uh, I, uh, is my screen visible? Yes. Right. So. Uh, the one of these maxims say that there are two ways of doing research. The first is to become an expert on using a set of tools and then search for problems which fit them. The second is to learn whatever tools are needed to solve problems you find interesting. And uh, the latter is the superior way. The, uh, the other maxim is about always working on more than one research problems. 
uh, if you put your all your energies and hopes on only one then you'll regret it when uh, things don't turn out the way they should and someone else can also scoop you um, he says that scooping happens very often so it doesn't matter how original you think it is likely that someone else may also stumble upon that so better work on your ideas diligently with focus and regularity of habits um do not always expect grandiose results to emerge from your research but they better be solid once you obtain such results and satisfy yourself that they are correct stick your neck out and publish them uh okay so doing your job well does not necessarily endear, endear you to your colleagues so do not particularly strive for it or expect it be polite to them but if their style diverges from yours in fundamental ways avoid interactions with them do not delude yourself in thinking that you will change them uh and the last thing um, as much as possible keep your private life separate from your professional life this will then be there will be then fewer things for other people to gossip about you so i thought i'll just uh, share um this and uh, all right uh, fine so all right there is another comment uh, from venkat and he says that what can now be revealed is the fact that dae and varc consulted him on shock behavior uh when they were designing the implosion package for nuclear devices oh that's fascinating although not surprising but um, that's wonderful to know that uh, some of these uh, studies or techniques were used there as well um all right so are there any other comments from the panelists or anyone would like to say something yeah ashwini uh, subramaniam here uh, so i just want to say that you know rn's maxims as interpreted by barton srinivasan should be essential reading for all young researchers yes. not only in india but i suppose uh, across the world so if if inyas can uh, <laughs> uh, give special publicity to the same i think that would be that would benefit a lot of people i would say certainly certainly uh, and we'll try uh, to post some links uh, to the article and, directly and also the next right and the revelations by siddhartha as well are very interesting i mean although not surprising like you say and yes i also want to point out that you know rn knew dr raja ramana very well um in the whole lcs story uh, in the la- longer version of the story uh, raja ramana also figures yeah. yes yes that's um, right. so i just want to take uh, you know about 30 seconds uh, yes, to please. share something um you know so a few days after um, rn passed i was uh, you know taking a walk across campus and i was i was thinking you know if i w- if i was to encapsulate rn life and legacy and the man that he was in one sentence uh, how would i do that and uh, you know i'll just share that i'll just put that up on the screen uh, for everyone to uh hold on a second okay so i yeah, my ah here it goes so this is uh, you know what uh, i could come up with so i just wanted to share this with uh, all the viewers wonderful yeah thank you great thanks uh, subramaniam so since there are no more comments and of course uh, please feel free to reach out to inyas this is a message for our audience and we would like to yeah, share Ashwini, more information if i can we just make one quick comment yes please go yeah so um, i think you know uh, this is this is a good forum inyas for the young people to get inspired and the kind of legacy uh, you know prasan nasim has created uh we should feel ourselves confident uh, fortunate to to you know, to bask in that glory so we have been fortunate to have been associated with him but even for others especially youngsters i think they should look at his work they should study his life and hopefully that will inspire them to take up research as their profession that's what i wanted to 
Thanks, Sarah. Um, okay, so I would also like to point that Inya's membership call is now open and to all young bright scientists in the country, please look at it and apply for membership. Um, all the panelists, it's, it has been a wonderful uh, last few weeks preparing for this event. And thanks for all your efforts. And also thanks to Rajani for coming up with this idea of uh, doing this event um, on Professor Narsimha. And once again, thank uh, we on behalf of uh, Inyas, we thank our audience and everyone. And also uh, the people involved in organizing these talks, Madhavi for logistics and other um, members from Inyas who have contributed in setting this up. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us and please be in touch with us uh, by mailing to uh, Inyas. Or uh, you can also uh, comment on the YouTube page or any other way that you would like. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwini. Thanks. Yeah, thanks to Inyas, Rajini, Ashwini, uh, Saurabh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.